Hello and welcome. My name is Dave Goldman and today I'm going to be doing a presentation on custom PowerShell object formatting. A little bit about myself. I've been working at Microsoft for 20 years, all in the messaging space. I'm currently a Fast Track Senior Escalation Engineer in Service Enablement and Deployment for M365. A couple years ago, um, I was primarily focused in the exchange space on offline address list segregation. I wrote the original offline address book integrity checker for fixing offline address list problems. I have a new project in the PowerShell gallery now called PS Service Principle, which allows the onboarding for Exchange Online PowerShell through certificate-based authentication. Um, I contribute to PS Framework when I have the time, and here's some links in the presentation to get in touch with me. You don't have to copy these down. These will all be in the presentation. They'll all be downloadable for you there. So today, I'm going to talk about these presentation topics. I'm going to briefly go into what an object is, how to dump it out, but more so, what are the core properties on the object that are needed for the formatting engine. So when the object goes down through the pipeline, the formatting engine knows how to get involved and look for these right before it, it's going to display it. Before it displays it, it'll go through a formatting and criteria process. Later on in one of the demos, I'm going to show you how to on the fly extend and format an object in an interactive PowerShell session. And then I'm going to show you how to do it in a module. I'm going to do this through eight demos and I have uh, some pretty cool stuff for those that like to do debugging. I have a slide in the slide deck that will talk about the debug break, break points that need to be set in order to debug this and see this work for yourself. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to kick off the lab. This is going to create a couple jobs and sessions that we're going to use through the presentation. This is just going to connect to my exchange tenant to pull back some mailboxes that we're going to take a look at. Okay, so what is an object? An object in its simplest form is nothing more than a container that just holds items. Each one of these objects originates from a .NET base object, and any actions that you take on an object happen within the context of that object. Now there's a core couple items for uh, an object that are pretty important. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask PowerShell to create a system.diagnostics process for me where all the handles are greater than 50. I want to sort them and I only want to get the first two and here I'm going to dump them out. So here you can kind of see briefly that there is a view a table format that was created. Now on this particular object we can see that we have four events methods and some properties total of 52 now what are these what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the get member commandlet and I'm going to dump out this process object that was stored in a variable and here you can see that we have a type this is like I said before is a system.diagnostics.process this is the object that was created by PowerShell we have some events that are on here. These allow us to raise notifications on an event when something happens, like in this case, if we dispose of an object or if we exited it. These methods allow us to take actions on this object. For example, if I wanted to dump something out to string, this is a method that would support that and uh, allow us to do that. And then we have properties, and there's several different properties on here. So we have script properties, property sets, and properties. The properties themselves are structured collections that allow us to store information such as integers, longs, strings, which you can see here, like for example, session ID stored as an integer. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this out and I'm going to move along to the two critical important items on an object. The first one is the PS type names. This is the type that does two things. It defines the type of the object, like we have here, 
And the second thing is it links this to a view. If I dump this out, we can see that when we asked to create a process object, it started as a system.net object and ultimately was presented back to us as a collection because we asked for two items. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the PS standard members. This is a member set and it has a definition of the default display property set. What this is, is allows us to use this collection to define properties that should be displayed if we do not have a system or user created view. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to dump out this display set and we can see here for this process, we have ID, handles, CPU, and then this is a cutoff for system information. And I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, about this. I'm just gonna throw a tip out there uh, on this. So we have a preference variable called format enumeration list. By default, this is set to four. So if you're looking at any type of collections, by default, the collection will be cut short. Um, earlier in the presentation, I ran and created some jobs. This one that I'm gonna dump out is the address list memberships. And for some mailboxes, you can see I have two that came back, a user called blocked and a user called boardroom. You can see for the address list memberships, there's four of them. We have the sales, the offline global address list, all lists and mailboxes. And then the rest are truncated. A very cool way is you can set that in, uh, format enumeration list to something else. I'm gonna set it to 15 and I'm gonna run the same thing. And you'll notice now I just changed my view on the fly to allow more of the collection, in this case, the entire collection, because it's less than 15, to be shown. So you don't have to go through anything crazy to kind of start hunting and pecking and digging to dump those out. And you can always change those back on the fly uh, if you need to condense that. You can change that to whatever you want. So that's that's basically it on objects. You know, what I did want to point out there, though, is the PS type names and the standard member set, which I'm going to show you how that starts to come together now. So for the PowerShell pipeline, what happens here is when I ran get process, we sent it to that data down to the next pipeline for where object, and then down to sort, and then down to format table. What happens when you hit enter is that goes to the PowerShell parser, we tokenize everything, and then we start to do our work. We go to get process, we send that to where object, that data goes to sort object. Now here's where the magic happens. Right before the display, comes back to the console, we're going to call out default and out host, and this is where the selection process happens. So a couple things are gonna happen here. The first thing is out default is going to grab that output in the background, and it's gonna call the PowerShell formatting engine and say, hey, I need you to do something for me. I want you to look up and resolve the object type to see if there's a predefined view. And that's going to come from the table cache when we start the interactive PowerShell session. In this case, this object that we're working on is a system.diagnostics.process. So we look up to see if there's a predefined system view with that. In this case, there is, and one gets displayed. What happens is if that does not exist, PowerShell will then look in the second option to see if there's a user-defined view that has been displayed in the types.ps1xml and format ps1xml, which I'll show you after this. Um, that's how you change the views on the fly in an interactive session or for a module. If there's no view, then we fall back to the default display property set. That says, at a minimum, what should we display back to the screen. And then if that's not there, PowerShell says, I give up. I'm just going to do my best. And I'm just going to create a list. And I'm just going to give you your information back to the screen. 
So let's move down to some of the jobs. Uh, here we're going to move to another demo. Now I had mentioned this earlier when I said uh, not using select object and there's something to be very, very cognizant of. I'm going to dump out a job object here and you can see that I have two mailboxes. For whatever reason, if I decided that I wanted to truncate that data, and I can see that the demo gods have failed here, so let me just change this really quick. We'll jump out, dump out the job data. We can see we have two mailboxes. If I go back and I'm looking for a particular mailbox and I'm using select object, what I'm doing is I am saying create me another object, toss away everything else. So if I go back and I take a look at what happened here, I went back to this job data, PowerShell says I'm being instructed to select a single object. We had a de deserialized object, which rightfully so came from Exchange. This was the mailbox data. And PowerShell took that object and created its own PS custom object. Tossed away the mailbox object and just gave us a single collection. So if you're working on collections and you have information, this is just a tip to be cognizant that you don't throw away some of that data because now in this new object doesn't contain it at all. So just be aware of that for formatting. Now, when I was talking about going through the formatting engine, uh, and I had mentioned there's two files. There's a types ps1.xml and there's a format ps1.xml. These files come with PowerShell and they're core to the system. You can see here that there's some predefined ones. Here's the diagnostics format. And we have the type files. These are built into the system. Now, one thing that I do want to um, point out here in this demonstration is I am using PowerShell 5.1. Okay. These are MAML formatted in XML. You can research this. This is the Microsoft Assistance Markup Language. And the, what these do is the format file will allow us to create our view. And we have four different custom views. We can create a table, a list, it can be wide, or it could be custom. And one thing that you never ever want to do is update these files yourself. You will destroy any type of working relationship you have with PowerShell. It's always best to make a copy of these, although for the most part you'll only need just the format ps1.xml file. Um, something else to note, starting with PowerShell 6, these are all, the type files are compiled into the PowerShell code. They are no longer in the system, so if you run a separate PowerShell session in 6 or above, and you try to do the get child on the type files, you will not see anything. They will not show up. Um, and the type file, as I had mentioned earlier, and I'll say it over and over to uh, do the presentation just to make it stick, is that the type just allows you to extend it for creating your own object. And so what I'm going to do here to show this on the system dot diagnostics process is I'm going to open up the system files. Now here's the types one and what I want to do is I want to search for process and I'm going to go down until I find system diagnostic process and I'll bring that to the top of the screen and now I'm going to go over to process here and this is in the format file. Okay, so in the type file, we have a PS standard member set, and we have that default display property set, which you saw in the process earlier. 
the ID, handle, CPU, system information, and name. And we start to define what this object looks like. We have some reference properties. We have some PS resources. We have alias properties. So what we're doing with this type is we're extending it. We're making this object what we want because it's a custom object. Over here, the view in the format file is nothing more than an XML format. It has a type name. There's that link again, system.diagnostics process. This is on the PS type name. So when PowerShell formatting engine gets involved and says, hey, what am I looking at? It sees the system.diagnostic process and it sees that we have a table. So we know we're going to display it in a table. We have all of the individual columns and headers. So we're saying, hey, for handles, we want this to be a width of seven and the alignment's gonna be right. We close that one out and then we go down to the next one. These files are loaded interactively into the PowerShell session when it starts. You don't have to do anything. This is a system defined type and view. And so if I close these out and I go back to my process, you can see that that's what PowerShell knew. Out default, got it, said, hey, we have a type name. Here's the type file. Here's the format. We're going to display this. And that's it. That's how that's created. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move into another demo, and we're going to start talking about actually creating these ourselves interactively in a PowerShell session. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to clear the screen and I am going to create my own PS custom object. My own object, I'm going to dump this one out so you can see in get member and you can see that there are a couple inherited methods on this and some note properties which are all of the information that I provided. However, we have a key problem. If I go to dump out this custom object, you'll notice that here it started as a system object and it's a PS custom object. There's no type associated with it. So if I dump this out, I just get a list and it just gives me everything. It didn't have any idea on how to format that. So there are a couple different ways on how we can go about predefined objects that were already created, and we want to extend those. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at three methods that are going to allow us to extend the type names. The first one is going to be add member. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to create another custom object but this time I have the PS type name assigned to it. And I'm just calling it my custom object one. And if I dump this out, I can see down here started as a system object. It was a PS custom object and at element zero, the first element, I have my association, my type link now. That's the first way to do it. The second way is that you can use the add member and use the custom object. So oops, clear, I'm going to use add member. And now you can see that my custom object now has this associated with it. The third method is if I create another custom object here and I create custom object three on the type, you know, for type names, you'll see there's again, system object. This is a PS custom object, but there's no link to it. So remember um, earlier, we have members and methods, um, properties and events and types. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you this really quick, but I'm going to go into this object. I'm gonna use get member to expand it you'll notice that you don't see those uh, extra additional properties. So what you have to do is you have to use a parameter called force. If you do force, 
this will allow you to see the other members um, that are on here and then there's another one called static um, these allow you to dig into the object a little bit more what we're looking for is we want to insert this to the ps type names so i'm going to do a get member on that and the static and force were just a way to show you the static members that are created on the object and the force just says i want you to show me everything the ps type names member attribute is what we're working with and if we do a get member on this we can see that there's a method called insert we point it a starting index and we give it the string value so if i go back here and i dump it out and now what i want to do is i want to call the insert method at the zero location and object three and then i go back and dump out my type names now you can see my custom object three is linked these links in the type are very critical uh, if you don't have them there you're not going to get any type of uh, association subsequently if you made a mistake um, and say for example i'm just going to add a second one and i'm going to insert this one okay now you see that there's two on there we don't need it we can always call the remove method which would remove that custom object three from it and that's how we can start to shape and mold these uh, custom objects so let's go back to the first object custom object that i created and now we're going to see how this starts to fit together interactively so i am going to dump out my custom object and you can see i have first name last name date and some properties i want to look at the very first element which is my custom object that's just what i called it now there's a function here or i should say method called update type data this allows me to update the type information on the fly uh, into the type na tape, type name cache i'm going to pass it my custom object which is the link from ps type names and I'm going to create the default display property set and I want to display only first name, last name, and company. The default display property will be just the first name and then the key property set, uh, it's custom, then I'm gonna force it. So by forcing it, I'm telling PowerShell in the interactive session, I want you to update the type table now because this custom view for my custom object does not exist. So we run that and now when I dump out my custom object uh, that does not run there we go this time it ran now we can see that when we dump out this object we have exactly what we asked for now something to note here we only updated the type information if you remember back to the selection process, there was four steps. We look for a system defined view. We look for a user defined view, which is backed by a type or format file. In this case, we use the type data and we went to the last option, which is the default display property set. We did this on, on the fly. I can even change this even more if I wanted to go back over here and let's say I'm going to add city to this dump it on the fly and you can see here that here's the view that i'm going to show now the big difference between select object and doing it this way is i have not thrown away any data maybe i want to take off company and city and run this again because I have another business department that asks well we there's too much information we just want first and last name but you still need to get access to it well 
I'm going to take this custom object. I'm going to run get member with the force option. And you can see here is my object. Type name link, my custom object. I can see some of the properties on here. Okay, this was the base object. Here's the extensions that I added, the extended I added, first name, last name, date, time, city, and so forth. And if we look down here, here's all the note properties, and they all still exist. So I can dump out any one of these that I want at any time. This is just what the view is showing, and this is just another way to, uh, to do it here. I am going to just do another format, and I formatted it back out in a list just to show that all of the data exists. So that is interactively within a PowerShell session. You can do it on the fly, pipe this out to a CSV, put it to a text file, serialize it in a JSON, send it to somebody in another group, and still retain all of the data. Now, there's a couple couple things that I want to make sure that you reference. Select object is going to have to make you go back, and you'll have to retain that collection. If you have thrown the collection away, you're going to have to start your query over. If you're working against the database object, that can take you quite some time. So this is the method that I would you know, suggest that you test with. Now, we're going to move into the last demo here, where I'm going to show you how to actually create a format and then what we're going to do is we're going to put it into a module so what i have done is i'm just going to show it to you here but i have pre-created this file already um, for my custom object this is sitting on my disk now this is how i was able to load it into the type file so what I'm going to do here is I want to update this format now. It's on the local disk. I'm going to run that. And now I have updated the format table within the interactive PowerShell session based on my format. As you can see here in XML, here's that view definition. Here's the type name right here and you can see that I've created my own table so first name last name and then I have just the alignment down here in the table columns this is where I have defined what I want it to display so when I ran my custom object what happened is PowerShell said do we have a system created view no do we have a user defined view oh we do and then it saw my custom object it went and looked in the format type table and it said oh we do have a custom object for this here's the xml information and it gave it to out host and displayed it to the screen now one thing i want to make super apparent um, a lot of people don't don't realize this this is the table view that we created however if i was to run format list we're only showing two items and that's because on the type data up here we have only defined the default property set for first name and last name we did not have a list view created for this so their system powershell formatting engine didn't find it but it did default back to the default display property set and that's why we got these these two so just be a little bit aware of that um, you don't want to have some issues and say well i ran a list and it threw away all of my stuff you're just looking at a different representation of that data and here if i dump out the ps standard members remember that's the member set I can see here that for the default display property set, we did first name, but these are the properties that we're going to display, and they're our custom properties. So you can have two independent views at the same time.
Uh, so that can be a little bit tricky. And for the last demo, what we're going to do is we're going to do this in a PowerShell module. Now, what I want to do is I want to work off of a job object because that's what I created for this presentation. I'm going to run a, a commandlet called get type data. And what I want to do is I want to pull back all of the jobs type data that we know about. And you can see there's quite a few of them. We have a Win32 scheduled job. We have an automation job, job um, state info. What I want to do is I want to run a command called get format data. And I want to dump out the system management automation job. This is the one that I want to make a copy of. I'm going to pipe that to export format data. And that's going to save that to my C colon temp. Now, uh, I want to give credit to Bruce Payette for this super awesome, awesome function. When I was reading his Windows PowerShell in Action book uh, and learning the XML some time back, I came across a super cool uh, function that allows you to format uh, XML documents. I made some modifications to it um, because I wanted to check for file encoding uh, and so forth, but I added it into this project. If you don't have it, you'll get it here. Uh, if you don't have the book, the Windows PowerShell in Action, I suggest that you uh, get a copy of it and read it. Super informational. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to format this document. I'm going to read it in. Uh, I put a bypass encoding check because by default the file was saved as UTF-7, not UTF-8 uh, bomb. And I'm going to cut and paste it. And, whoops. and what are we going here? Bypass encoding check. Let me see. We're having a problem with the lab real quick. Encoding check. presentation. All right, I'm not sure what that was, but demo gods tried to get me and I'm not going to allow it. So what I did was I ran the format XML document and I pulled it in. And the reason why I wanted to do this was because I wanted to put the string representation view in Notepad so I don't have to go and mess around with all the XML nodes and so forth. And this would allow me to come in here and change this. Now, you can use this as a template. You can save it over and over, and you can modify this. This is how I got started with creating uh, my format. Now, this is it. This is your XML data. You can just go through here, and you can play around with those to modify those to what you need for your project. All right, so let me clear the host. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to dig into the module. So for a module and not an interactive session, when you load your inter when you load your PowerShell session, your module may not be loaded by default. You may need to import your module. And in that case, what's going to happen is the first important thing that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to look at your PSD1 file. And in the PSD1 file, you're going to look for format to process. By default, this is going to be commented out. You're going to want to uncomment this and make sure that this points to wherever your file is. I recommend that you use your module name dot format ps1.xml. In my module outline here, I have an XML directory. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up that format file. This is where I paste my formats and you'll notice that I have two. The recommend recommendation in PowerShell is not to use multiple format files. Just use one. It can read them all. It could read them all in. Um, you'll notice here, here's the type name for this project. This is PowerShell jobs. Here I have the code that I was showing you, center name. And now these are the table column headers. For the column items, you can do cool stuff like putting in 
script blocks. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm just reading the name information and I'm saying if the string is longer than 15, I want you to cut it down and I could name or rename these on the fly. So this is the code for my first one and then you'll notice I just put a comment and here's my second one. So I have two formats defined in this one file that will get loaded when the module gets loaded. Okay, so to recap, the PSD1, you want to formats to process. You want to have your XML format views in this file. And then the third critical thing is your function. So we will start with the jobs first. So here's my job code. And this is a custom function that I wrote that I want to do some stuff with jobs. Jobs are a pain in the neck. When you run them, then you have to remember to run receive job, keep the data, otherwise you've tossed it. Well, what I did was I created a custom object. I put the type name in to associate it so the formatting engine knows what to look for. And I put the information that I want. Now, what's critical here is that these the variables or the keys and, and indexes, um, key value pairs inside this custom object, they must match what your XML file is. Uh, if you don't, you're gonna run into some big issues. So let me see if I can separate this. So we'll, we'll go back to the code. You'll notice I have my index, name, job ID. If I come over here, you'll see I have index. The script block takes the place of the name. That's why I have it labeled in the column header, name, and then job ID, type of job, job state. And you'll notice that these all follow in. If these are not matching what your XML matches, your view will be broken and it will not display it. You're gonna get an unpredictable result, most likely in the list, um, and it, it's not going to look good. So this is the first one. So if I go back to the presentation and I do a get job, this is what PowerShell pulled back based on the beginning of the presentation when I ran the startup code. Uh, I created a remote job, I created a backup job, and then I have another remote job. And the two of them, one goes to office365.com, which was for my get mailbox. The other one, I went to the local system. Now, one thing to note, um, if you're in 5.1, you can run um, a workload that it won't won't work uh, in 6 or above. And I in here, I put a, a note. So if you happen to be running this, uh, let's see where it is. Yeah, I'm sorry, the workflow. Uh, it's not supported in 6. So depending on that version, you may get a failure when you run the reproduction here for yourself. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run my custom function. And you can notice here, it looks completely different. I've added my index. I've added the job ID. I changed it from ID to job ID, the type of job. So I'm starting to format this. But what is important for me is that when I have a job, I like to see where I was connected to. Okay, Here you have that. So I wanted to keep it, but I changed it. But the most important thing is the contains data. In my code, what I decided was that I wanted to receive my jobs and I wanted to keep the data and have it returned to me on the fly so I don't have to go get this job and then do a receive and do a keep. So right here, if I do this as jobs and I say I want to do job one, I can go right to the data field and I can have my mailboxes here. So I've created a custom function to pull back my data to display what I want to show. And that's how I've done you know, the jobs. Now I'm going to clear the host and I've also done this for sessions too, because I do a lot of stuff with remoting. And what I'm going to do here is this is just the normal get PSS session. And you can see it's really boring. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run mine 
and I've changed the view again. So now I can see that by default we truncate it. I want to see the whole computer name and I want to see where I'm connecting to. More importantly, I like the versions that are supported because when you're connecting to a remote uh, connection host, you could have a mismatch where the configuration file says, I don't want you to accept 14.1.218, maybe 219. It helps for troubleshooting, but I also like to see the ports that are available. I don't want to have to go digging for them and because um, it's just a pain in the neck. So if I dump out this first session, you'll notice here, this is by default. This is just the generic session that you have here. Um, shows you the token provider, shows you the current module that the um, proxy functions were stored in for the session. And you have some idle timeouts. It's kind of, you know, how does this help me? So what I've done is I've changed this and created my own list. And so what I'll do is I'll break this down for you, but I'll show you the get session with format. And in the get session format, here's the, the custom code just runs through the sessions and it basically names them. If this is exchange online, call it EXO, get me the supported versions. Still created a PS custom object. Here's the type names and here's the data that I want to pull back. Now, what's different between the table and the list? If I go to the format file and I go down to sessions, you'll notice here that I only have ID, name, computer name, type, session state, and so forth. So if I run that, and it, that is going to display exactly what the system is found in this format and this is what it's giving me if i want to see a different representation i could do a format list and this is going to show me the entire ps custom object you'll notice here in the list we now have the cancel timeouts so i can see a, a much more easy user function uh, i should say user ready um, data that allows me to take a look at this and see what the default timeouts are. Very easy, I don't have to go do calculations on Bing or another website or use a calculator. I can look right here to see, oh, here's the cancel timeout in hours, 15 minutes, and so forth. And you have it all in one very small package. These can be changed on the fly. Now the one thing to note and um, let's see if the demo gods don't catch me today. Clear host. Now, with the individual interactive session, you can just run update type data, update format data. It will update the table on the fly. That will not work if you're in a function, or I should say in a module, excuse me. I'm going to go back to the job and let's just say I want this to say type of jobs and I save it. I go back to the job code and I'm going to change this type of jobs. And then I run get job with format. You'll notice nothing has changed. What you have to do is you're going to have to import your module again. This will not get rid of anything that you have. But what you have to do is you have to use the force option. That parameter will go ahead and re-import the type data and the format table and you'll see now type of jobs. So I once again was able to change this on the fly and so this will allow you to make any easy adjustments that you need to make to your uh, custom objects. And with that, um, that comes to a conclusion of this presentation. I hope you found this information valuable. And uh, if you need or have any questions, once you download the presentation, you have the contact links, feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm on Twitter a lot. 
and I hope you have a great day. Take care.